Chris. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the role of uh, AI in education, I'm talking about you know, personal, accessible, and instant. Will AI replace our teachers? So I'm going to start off by talking about the current trends in education. Then I'm going to talk about education's role in society, the future of AI in the classroom, and uh, lastly, the implications that it may have. So just imagine, when you're a little kid, you may have woken up about 7 o'clock, you have to go to school for about 8.30, you go to the same, same homeroom, same classroom with all your friends, doing the same thing throughout the day. And this has happened throughout our entire lives. But now imagine, you wake up at 7 a.m., your father has a smoothie ready, you eat breakfast, you meet up with your friend Greg at 8, you walk to school, to the same classroom, to the same teacher, but you're going to start off with algebra, you're a little behind, you need a little bit more practice, you'd rather start off and start the day with something you don't like as much, and end the day with a subject that you enjoy. But your friend, despite being in the same classroom, having the same teacher, he's going to start the day with grade 6 geography. It's his best subject, he loves it, he's way ahead of everyone else, but he prefers to start off the day with a subject that he enjoys, and end it with something that he needs to work on. So, I'm going to be talking about um, early childhood education. So, in, so I'm actually kind of like grade 2, grade 6. Now, it's proven that um, the education at this point provides long-term academic and social benefits to children. So it's very dependent on kind of the institution as well as the teachers that are providing it. So now looking at the current trends, what's currently happening in education around the world? Beginning with developing countries, there's a lot of there's been a large progression from where it once was. In the year 2000, uh, UNESCO had a world forum that stated that by 2015 there's going to be universal primary education. Now, they failed every single goal set out in that for 2015, but significant progress was made. But the places that, and the countries that did progress and that do have schools, there's several issues. First, there's economic barriers. Not every child can afford to go to school. They might have to help out around the house, they might have to work to bring in some more income so their family can be fed. Then there's distance. The, you know, near school might be an hour and a half, two hour walk away, one way. Then, the teachers, that they, they don't have any teachers. So you can have a school, which is great, but if you have too many children, or you can't fill them with teachers, then there's no point having a school there. And finally, the teachers that they do have, they're not good quality teachers. They don't know how to teach, they might not be as educated, and thus the education suffers. So there might be the schools available, or not. By the way, there's barriers involved. Looking at developed countries, it's a little less focused on kind of economic, it's still economic, um, but a little less focused on progression and more on sustainability. So looking at the No Child Left Behind, this represents the standardized test culture that we have, especially in the United States. So this trend, the standardized tests are now looking at being a little bit worse off. They're not focusing much on learning, just more on grades and testing. Now there's uh, certain movements of, uh, against that as well. Now uh, massive online open courses. So these came out a few years ago, they were big news, they were expected to you know, start overtaking universities. Now this hasn't happened quite at the rate that those founders have thought, but they are making several strides. Um, so for example, Coursera at the University of Alberta, uh, they have a course on the spe product, specialized, product management software um, specialization that you can get a certificate for. So meanwhile, they're not accredited institutions, it's starting to move towards um, recognized education. And finally, technology integration. So students uh, from a younger age are starting to get more involved and on their phones more often to a point where it's become a distraction. A school in France has actually banned smartphones entirely after they recommended 200 uh, in a single term. So rather than, my theory is, rather than having to fight technology and the, the usage, why not embrace it? And this is what a lot of schools and a lot of large global organizations such as UNESCO are looking to do. So looking at the education's role in society, now, where does education play at what levels? So in developing countries, it helps break that cycle of poverty. Education is attributed to significant economic benefits and can help the 90% of low-income countries whose uh, population live in poverty to break free from that. It can help bypass industrial revolutions. Now with climate change being on the forefront of a lot of minds, a lot of countries are looking to, and a lot of uh, countries, emerging economies, looking to have their own industrial revolution so they can get past that and become more like the richer countries in the world, we can't really afford to have everyone go through their own industrial revolution the same way previous countries have. Um, so China's a good example of that, looking at the smog and the steps they have to take to start reversing some of the damage that's been caused by all the pollution from the factories and the automobiles. 
And India is another good case example where they use education to just bypass the industrial revolution entirely and become a service-based economy to contribute to their growth. Finally, uh, gender equality. Uh, so the government of Canada has stated that um, primary education for women allows them to um, get better jobs, the access to education allows them to, um, they have fewer children, and the children that they do have are less susceptible to sickness. And within the developed countries, uh, it's more about con competitiveness and continued prosperity. Education is a good um, indicator of how well a, company, or a country is doing, the type of companies and jobs are able to pull in. Uh, so, for example, DeepMind here uh, in Edmonton, 2017, DeepMind opened up a lab uh, in conjunction with the University of Alberta, and this brought in a lot more AI education, AI funding, and put Edmonton on the world map in terms of companies looking, and then Borealis with RBC followed soon after. And then teachers. Um, teachers have a significant role in society as well as education. So looking at Finland, um, up there in the US here, the US used to be ranked 6th in the world for education. Now they're ranked 36th out of 2016. And this is due in part to a decreased uh, investment into education compared to the increase in enrollment of students and the emphasis that they put on teachers. As it's well known that they're typically um, not paid as much, they have to go out of pocket to provide supplies to their students. Um, meanwhile, in Finland, they have more personalized learning, less standardized tests, you know, post-secondary education is free, and only 10% of applicants are actually able to get into teaching programs within Finland, and they're considered a profession, um, a significant profession that contributes heavily to the economy and to the country. So, with all these trends um, coming into, uh, with all the current trends with education and the significant role it plays in society in our progression, where does AI fit into the future of the classroom? So it begins with personalized learning. Now personalized learning is data oriented, it's individualized, and it's adaptive. It's able to, you're able to give a software, a learning software to, uh, to students with, uh, using technology that tracks students through each grade. It's able to determine the best method of learning and adapt that through each grade. So they're able to, you know, uh, if one student reacts better to lectures, it can focus more on providing them lectures, video lectures, in-person lectures. If one person is more through discussion and discovery, they're able to go through that method as well. And then it can follow the change in patterns. Not everyone will learn the exact same way through their entire um, schooling, um, schooling career. You know, the AI will be able to learn through the different patterns, see little tweaks year over year, and be able to adjust that. Additionally, there's a proven effectiveness. Um, there's been testing uh, to determine the lecture effectiveness. So a group of students um, were scanned with MRIs while watching video lectures at Princeton to determine, you know, the, their concentration levels. Um, if anything has to be, kind of, if anything went over well enough, um, and just to determine the differences between students. And an even better example is a high school in St. Louis. Um, they implemented a, a personalized learning software that was able to track students and help them with algebra. Um, now this high school was primarily made up of poor and black students, and they had a 6% proficiency in algebra. Um, so they were a little bit in a crisis, but in five years of implementing this program, they were able, able to increase that to almost 45%. And then teacher augmentation or replacement. So this personalized learning, does it replace teachers? So the short answer is no. But it does provide a lot more individual time. Now it's proven that smaller class sizes and increasing um, an increased time of one-on-one -on -one with the teacher is able to improve students socially and academically, um, as well as uh, improve their uh, emotion towards learning. People want to learn and they enjoy learning more often if they're able to have more time to spend with their teacher. And, but there, there is a greater emphasis on social development. So with this AI-driven personal, uh, personalized learning software, students are using technology a lot more and worrying less about the teacher standing up in front of the class, writing notes, um, we're going over textbook, textbook examples. Teachers are able to focus more on specialized issues within students with the curriculum, and they're able to, especially um, with the topic of the primary education, really focus on having them um, integrate into society and interact with their classmates outside of their family. Now looking at global accessibility, there's two major things here, and that's technology distribution and massive online courses. Now, I mentioned earlier with that teachers won't be replaced, but in my opinion, that's probably typically geared towards developed countries. If a personalized learning software is strong enough, I feel that it could replace a teacher to some extent in developing countries to help overcome some of those barriers mentioned earlier. 
um, if it's effective. Uh, so first off, looking at smartphone adoption. Uh, in emerging countries uh, such as in Indonesia, Brazil, India, um, smartphone adoption among young persons has reached up to 65%, with some places increasing 20% over the last three years. And you're seeing more and more inexpensive smartphones coming, and the progression of that technology is slowing very slightly, which means that more students and more young persons are able to get access to this technology. Then there's one laptop per child. So these laptops, um, this is an a not-for-profit organization that provides um, very, very low-cost laptops with incredibly high battery lives to children in developing areas, um, such as you know, Madagascar. Um, they had a test pilot there and it was incredibly successful. Um, and then global internet. So companies like Tesla, Google, and Facebook are all looking at building these global internets, whether it's through satellites or you know, internet balloons. Their goal is to make sure everyone on Earth, no matter how remote, has access to the internet. And then uh, massive online open courses. Um, so these are able to be relevant and social. So much of them, they have discussion forums, you're able to go in, talk to whoever the professor was or whoever um, some of the TAs were, uh, in, in addition to uh, your other classmates, whether they're around the world or not. Um, it's often very inexpensive. You're able to access these courses on some for $60 a month, and other you can get an entire course for $15, depending on what it is and where you're getting it from, and it's open to all. Um, there's no, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these courses are open in several different languages, and they have different learning styles that you're able to go through, whether it's videos or reading or seminars, and you're also able to go at your own pace. So all of this, you're able to provide those barriers, those economic barriers, those geographical barriers, as well as the, the issue of having no teachers or low quality teachers, um, by providing that uh, technology and replacing that with, um, they're able to learn at home, and they're able to learn what they want. So maybe at a current stage where a child is with a family, they might have a farm. So rather than focusing purely on certain areas of geography or mathematics, they could focus on different ways to, uh, practical ways to increase crop yields and go from there. So now this brings us to instant learning. So this will most likely happen when the singularity happens. Now there's two different trains of thought for that that I'll get into in a moment. But for instant learning, essentially what it'll be, whether we're um, transhuman or whether it's more cybernetic and merge with AI and maintain our bodies, but you'll essentially be able to download any information you want instantly. So there's no real reason to go sit in a lecture for you know, a couple hours to learn what you need to do or watch a few videos on it, is you can just download the information. If you're going on a big trip to somewhere you've never been, you can just download and learn that language the night before. Um, instead of spending an entire semester reading a textbook, you can, or instead of spending four years to get a degree, you can download the entire curriculum in four hours. Um, so the two kind of main uh, areas of thought that kind of apply to instant learning and how we would is very first of all, um, as we mentioned in the class, as a, a well-known futurist, but he thinks that we're going to abandon our bodies and become transhuman, essentially uploading our mind and consciousness um, to a machine or some sort of um, electronic being. Uh, an example of, kind of stuff that's happening right now that coincides with this point of view is a company called Netcom. And what they're working on doing, um, they're currently at the Y Combinator Startup Bootcamp, and what they're, typically, what they're doing right now is they're taking $10,000 and replace, and for that $10,000, they're working on kind of freezing your brain to preserve, preserve the brain as well as the memories within, um, in the hopes that by kind of 2045, though your body might be old and frail, your mind will still be preserved and it'll be able to be uploaded to some sort of machine or being at that point. And then there's Elon Musk. Uh, so Elon Musk uh, is very, he's the founder of OpenAI in addition to SpaceX and Tesla and he's a very big believer that AI will eventually take over in some capacity and he thinks that we should merge with AI. Uh, so essentially creating the cybernetic singularity. Um, so, so through this we'll either have kind of brain implants or some sort of augmentation to our minds that we can upload uh, down with the information to. Um, this can either be we kind of just download the knowledge right to ourselves, um, or another way is that we just get the knowledge as we need it. So there's no worry about having to retain it. Um, it's just if, if you're going to kind of do something, you learn it right then and there, and then you kind of forget about it after because you no longer need that information. Um, now this comes with an inherent risk that if some sort of catastrophe does happen, um, that maybe the system crashes or you know something like a solar flare that does fry electronics, you know, if we don't have that knowledge anymore within ourselves, is it kind of lost forever? Um, and then he also kind of speaks on how humanity is anti. So if we don't do this, 
Um, AI might just see us as an anthill. If there's an anthill where we want to build a highway, we have nothing against ants, but we're going to build a highway. Um, so that could be something with AI too. It could be a friendly AI, but it might see us as an anthill. If it wants to do something, it might just pay for us without having a second thought. So with instant learning, there's several implications that come with this. If students aren't going to school to you know, sit for six hours and learn, uh, they can just do everything at home, or they can be as smart as a 40-year-old by the age of 12, what's the point of having school? Um, so that's where social conditioning comes in. School is a major part of our institutionalized society that provides a lot of social conditioning. It's often a child's first exposure outside of their immediate or extended family, and living in a rules and order-based um, system, you know, especially if their parents aren't very strict or have uh, many rules in the house. Um, all right. um, then critical thinking and creativity. So at this stage, we might have theoretically infinite knowledge, um, whether that's you know, the right knowledge or wrong knowledge, we won't know at this point, but we have to maintain kind of what makes us human, or at least partly human. Um, so the big thing with this is that AI might be creative at this stage. There's no telling what but right now it's, you know, it's highly specialized, and you know, Sir Ken Robinson, who's a quite decorated uh, professor of education, so the humans are inherently curious, creative, and diverse. And so this um, area aspect has to do with keeping that. So taking an example with AI and creativity is a lot of, using art as an example, a lot of art is kind of about how it makes a person feel looking at it and about the artist's story behind it. But if that artist is an AI, does it invoke that same sort of um, emotion to the viewer? So this could be an area of discussion uh, regarding if AI can truly be creative. And this is where school comes in. We are inherently creative, yes, but different people have different areas of creativity, and uh, often this creativity has to be honed um, and trained so people can uh, reach its full potential, and that's where teachers can help out as well. Um, so speaking of teachers, so it's the change role of teachers. So as we learned with medicine at large, physicians are going to change from very uh, much more kind of social and spiritual um, connection with the patients as opposed to the diagnosis and treatment, and I see very much the same as teachers. So instead of focusing on the teaching aspect of it and having children learn academically, they're going to fo be focused on being social role models. Um, so with that, a lot of the training is going to have to change. They're not going to be subject-based to learn, you know, relearn algebra and science to reteach that to um, a group of students. They're going to be taking more sociology and uh, psychology and kind of child development courses um, to be effective. And then uh, looking at kind of design of babies. Um, so, you know, genetically, we may be able to enhance uh, their intelligence genetically, or um, if we are having some sort of cybernetic singularity, you might be able to download information to the babies pre-birth, so they come out kind of smarter than everyone else. Now, there's a lot of ethical conversations around this area. Um, within America, most adults disagree on having um, intelligence and strength augmented within babies. Um, and in China, with the example that we were seeing in class, and the way the Chinese government reacted, not necessarily that it was unethical itself, but the procedure of not getting uh, proper approval um, and the steps taken towards getting there um, was unethical and not right of the scientists. So in summary, um, education is critical in both developed and developing countries. Educational methods are changing rapidly due to technology, whether it's personalization um, or global access. Education will be tailored to individual students. There will be no more mass lectures um, where everyone's learning the same thing at the same pace. People will be able to learn what they want um, as long as there are checkpoints to make sure that students are learning. Um, children around the world will be able to access high quality education through AI. We're not gonna have to be worried about finding the right teacher to be able to send them into some remote area for a year um, to teach um, and not have to go through that stress, cost, and time. Um, just to find out they might not even be a good teacher. This stuff is, would be tried and true. Then instant learning will dramatically change society and alter teaching roles. Um, teachers will still be relevant, but just in a different capacity. And finally, society as a whole must keep up with technology to make sure we proactively adapt. Um, if we don't, the educational systems um, will not be in place that are required and might uh, start being uh, larger increases in income gaps and inequality as these personalized softwares will only be available to those who can afford it if the government doesn't step in to make sure it's available to all. Um, so I just want to thank you and see if there's any questions. So any questions? Do you think all uh, knowledge is uh, 
evidence-based and uh, something you can put in words. Like, what, what about, how, how will you teach uh, students sports in the future? Um, you know, catching a ball in the outfield and so on. You're not really putting words together and calculating trajectory as you go up there. You're, 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 it's, it's sort of instinctual based on previous things that you've done. And there are probably things in medicine that are comparable to that, taking really good care of patients based on experience with previous patients, it's hard to put every bit of that into words and, and have it all you know, evidence-based and that sort of thing. So somehow we have to incorporate tacit knowledge, right, T-A-C-I-T, in, into this and have us still be able to learn those things that are not entirely things that you can just write it down and people are going to read what you've written down and that gives the whole answer, and then you have the skill. Yeah. yeah, but I think part of that is, you know, that changing role of teachers is students will still have some sort of schooling and time away, um, especially if parents still have to work, they need to be kind of overseen. And I think part of that social aspect of teachers, I don't really touch upon physical education, more so kind of just academic education, but I think that would take on a bigger role. You know, students could theoretically kind of just download the knowledge of the game of football, know the rules, kind of know how to hold your hands and everything. But when it comes to kind of the more kinetic aspect of it, it feels like it feels play. like yeah. um, I yeah. think that kind of would be a bigger aspect of education in the future and could lead to a you know, healthier population. Yeah. And I think the Kurzweil idea of uploading your consciousness to a ceramic slab, the games would be different then. It's not that there would wouldn't be games, <laughs> but they'd be significantly different. Are you talking about like social conditioning? It's like one of the benefits, right? Of, like, so like, would I, I missed it? Like, would we still have that if we upload all our, like, we get all our data, we download them? Yeah. So um, one of the uh, areas I mentioned uh, was with kind of the role of teachers. So students would still go to class even with instant learning, but instead of kind of class, it would be more of a social conditioning um, area. So they're able to learn about being in society and stuff like that. Um, from a behavioral standpoint as opposed to kind of a more academic standpoint and teachers take more of a role of a social role. Oh. Um, yeah, so some of your thoughts depend on the technological singularity and then you were talking at the beginning about developing countries and how this might be able to make more equitable conditions. However, kind of on that, do you think like the technological singularity will be equally distributed and kind of if so or if not, how will that impact the access people have to these educational softwares or AI? that can like upload stuff into your bed. Yeah, so I think part of that has to do with kind of the governments um, proactively adapting to technology. And I think it's up to a lot of those richer countries that are developing these technologies to ensure they're distributed. Um, with this type of technology, theoretically, you're able to distribute resources a lot more efficiently. And you should be able to solve things, um, you know, issues like poverty and those a lot more, um, a lot more efficiently and a lot more inexpensively. So I think on the inequality standpoint, I think it really depends on kind of the legislation, the regulations that are uh, input. Um, so kind of like the personalized learning, um, UNESCO put in another 2030 plan for universal primary education another 15 years from now, um, and introducing a lot more technology to it. So I think it really depends on how, how much emphasis they put on kind of that global education, and if they feel kind of current methods in developed countries kind of what fit in developing countries, um, though I disagree with that, I think it should be. Um, obviously equally distributed, um, but I think it really depends on what society um, is. Um, just, yeah. oh, just to kind of follow up on that, like you mentioned that like it's kind of on the onus of governments to take that action. Um, but I mean, like in the world we see today, there's quite a disparity, even though governments like have the potential capability to take more action. So do you think technology is going to change that? And like, is, is there some way that technology will make governments more willing to cooperate or make things available? Like, just because the technology itself makes it accessible doesn't mean the, the yeah. technology is accessible, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, as mentioned earlier, with the personalized learning aspect and global accessibility. Um, so a lot more kind of not-for-profits, like the one that talk for child, um, stuff like that that provides that technology to students um, that are in kind of more remote areas or poor areas. I think getting them educated <coughs> 
um, at a rate that will be much faster than the way that we've been educated in the past. I think that will help kind of bring those countries up to um, the same levels as well and get them involved with the global conversations. It's uh, amusing to think of what the original fear was of, you know, technology and teaching. It wasn't that AI was going to take over, it was that the one best teacher in the world would end up teaching every single class and all the other te teachers would be out of job. It's not even the idea of massive online courses, but just Vaguely, we, we thought that that one person would be able to, you know, disseminate their best lectures to the whole world, and everybody else teaching that subject would would be out of a job. It now seems unlikely that that, that is really going to uh, play out like that. But there, there, there's bound to be like fads, right? That not only do you want your child well educated, but if there's a particular way of being well well educated that's popular, you want that used, right? And and we don't really know whether that's going to be like the best AI or, or this absolutely mesmerizing teacher who just teaching this subject to the whole whole world. Probably not, but we can't absolutely rule that out. Yeah. Um. Just to explore some of the assumptions, um, you know, I'm mainly curious about the content that would be downloaded. Assuming we achieved some technological ability to interface with the brain, and we can figure out what data looks like, and we can, but then it, it raises that question: What's the difference between mere data, you know, facts, you know, the capitals of the countries of the world, or the formula for certain math problems, and wisdom? You know, and, and what might we know about how the brain works? I mean, there's reason to believe that the brain receives bits of data and then it creates its own way of mixing them up. And, and that is what builds experience and wisdom. So what I'm really curious about is whether that second order, like that higher level of distilling data, would be able to be codified and downloaded. So will we be able to deliver actual wisdom or just data points? Because if it's, if it's just data points, you know, then it makes me wonder, is education really going to change? Or it means that we're just going to have to sit in a room, discuss the data with each other, you know, and build the connections in the brain that way. Yeah. So any thoughts? Um, so I think that kind of falls under the critical thinking and creativity part a little bit um, in terms of the wisdom. So these are the parts that are kind of unsure of what AI will be capable of in the future. Um, will it be able to be you know, critical thinkers with the data given? So assuming with the instant learning aspect of it merging with AI, the level that we'll have to learn critical thinking depends on that AI's level of critical thinking. But if we do, um, that's kind of what the teacher's role would be as well, in addition to the social angle of it, would be teaching students how to think with the knowledge that they're using. Um, and so with that knowledge as well, you know, whether it's kind of at, you know, at the point knowledge where we just get when we need it, or whether it's you know hundred percent down and we have it all all times. Um, I think that's kind of one of the big questions that I, I had with the implications was, you know, we can have all this knowledge, great, but where's the critical thinking? Where's the wisdom? How are we actually using it? Um, so I think it really just depends on kind of what that artificial intelligence looks like in you know 25, 30 years. How intelligent is it? Yeah. Uh, I think on a similar note to um, what Dr. Goldstein was saying and what you were saying about critical thinking, but also thinking about how about diversity of thought as well, because um, if the AI is able to also have these critical thinking abilities, which is, which is great, cause, but everybody would, would they not kind of have a similar style of critical thinking, um, which, is, which is good, but at the same time, sometimes you need people who think about things in different way, correct, to have, um, yeah, to move, I guess, progress forward uh, instead of kind of perhaps getting stuck in one method. So I was wondering, do you have any comments on perhaps how we can solve the problem of diversity? Yeah, that inherent diversity, just with Ken Robinson's kind of three principles that he talked about, the diversity, curiosity, and creativity, um, I think that the diversity aspect um, will be one of those things that's quite diminished um, if AI does have critical thinking. We'll all have the same knowledge, we'll all think very similarly, 
But I think that's where the creativity aspect comes in, um, is that humans will have kind of different here in talents, such as the physical talents, and will have kind of different creative outputs um, that I don't think, in my opinion, the AI will quite be able to replicate um, in terms of what we consider intel being intelligently creative. Um, so I think with that diversity, I agree, I don't think we'll be as diverse in our ways of thought, um, apart from the creativity of the AIs. So pro probably in the beginning, there'll be branding Right, there'll be like different brands of AI that you can get, and they'll work differently. But just like you know, in uh, videotapes, you know, Betamax was actually better than VHS, but nobody bought it, so it sort of gradually died out. Right, so there'll be things like that that you know, eventually, we'll probably all end up using the same system. And this whole idea of branding and selling stuff. When, when you're providing something that the whole world needs, <laughs> and, and if everybody's using the same thing, then there's some argument that there shouldn't be much of a profit in that. You know, it's just a basic human need. So we, we would reach that point, but before that, you know, there would be like Mac uh, and PC and other, you know, Android <laughs> and so on. Right, so so we go through a period like that, of branding differences, but that kind of diversity might not help us much. It doesn't really bring richness to you know discussions. It's just sort of random, right? It might not be like true diversity of you know, vantage points. I just wanted to add something on. Um, like speaking of the branding thing, I think a, a possible way that diversity could be added is what like knowledge files or packages your your parents or your family kind of tell you to download like as a child, right? Just like how you know uh, you take your kids to church or you take them to specific things that mean a lot to you then those could be the specific things that are downloaded to your children and those kind of values pass on which are identical to everyone. Yeah. No, I think that that's, that's right. And for a while we wouldn't be the board, but in the long run maybe we would be, the, everybody would be connected to everybody else and so those individual differences would sort of even out. Like along your guys' point, like isn't it tech technological singularity when like AI always has the right answer? So like, do we even need diversity? We need diversity now because like no one knows who's the right answer. But at that level, I think AI will probably always have the right answer, as bad as that sounds. Yeah. But. but as you guys are pointing out, there are multiple levels. There's having the information. I think it won't be very long before it will be true that you will always have the information that you need. But that doesn't mean that you'll be able to make proper use of it. You may not be able to sort it or make you know, educated decisions based on having the information. So, but then you can codify that as well. And, 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 and so ultimately, I think, um, you know, these less, uh, useful ways of using knowledge will die out. But, but I think even advanced AI will still have a whole bunch of questions that it won't know the answer to. Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't change you know, the, the high complexity. You know, so, the, so the question of exactly how much taxation should the citizens receive, you know, I, you know and, you, and you argue, you know, 30, 40, 50. I can't see an AI um, coming to a conclusive answer, you know, a different AI would come to a different answer. But I think there will still remain these questions where the data doesn't answer the question definitively, or, or even if it does, people will disagree about what they hear. Or maybe you don't have the data for it to be. Yeah, or you know, there's just too much. You, you don't have all the data you need. Yeah, m most of the exa examples of AI being perfect giving answers is making choices between two things, right? So even that is, is pretty tough to perfect. But 
in a kind of open field where you don't have any specific answers asking a question that nobody knows the, the answer to. It. So that's a whole, whole different deal from saying, you know, which career should I pursue, uh, you know, where should I live, who should I marry, those are kind of specific things. AI is a perfect matchmaker. <laughs> Potentially, someday, yeah. That's right. Okay, thank you very much.